Ephesians 1, verse 4. There's that one verse of the song that I said last Sunday that's special to me. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. We hear often in church this expression, the plan of salvation. And most people who talk about that have no idea what it is. Okay. It's God's fail safe plan. What's that? It means that God had a plan that covered all contingencies in case anything went wrong that he could guarantee our salvation. Something that he thought out, planned, and executed. In verse 4 it says, let's read it. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's when the plan was made. Before the foundation of the world. Now, here's another expression that we hear a lot. That most preachers that I've heard use it are erroneous in it. We think about foundation, we think about something starting. Okay, in this case, it doesn't mean that. The word foundation here, strictly concordance, it means overthrow. Before the overthrowing of the world. What's it talking about? It talks about the time when Satan rebelled and threw this earth into chaos. And that's the overthrowing of the earth. When did this fell safe plan go into effect? Before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? So this way. We got these dates, you know, B.C., A.D., so on and so forth. Let me give you a new one. Before sin. Before there was sin, God made an escape from sin. To go real deep on you, okay? Sin was out there only in a possibility form. God knew about it in his wisdom, but he knew it had to be dealt with, period. Because until it was exposed, came to life, and crucified, it would always be lurking in the future, ready to destroy anything. So what did he do? In his wisdom, he makes an angel, Lucifer, and gives him everything necessary to become God. He said, oh, you're the leading chair. You're the smartest one. You're the brightest one. He was covered in jewels. He led the whole heavenly host. And he gave him, along with all this beauty and knowledge and wisdom, free will. And with that free will, Lucifer had the right to worship God. And continue worshiping God to this day. Or as God knew that he would. Lucifer chose to become God. And become the whole most high. And that's why in Isaiah it says. And when sin was found in his heart. That was the beginning of. Took this sin thing. And brought it to life. Now sin's out there. As a result of it. The world. Was overthrown. You had a whole new rebellion take place now. Another empire is born. The overthrow of the, of the foundation of the world. So now, God can deal with sin. But before this ever took place, he had a plan. To redeem man. He had the virgin birth in mind. The sacrificial lamb of God already laid down in line. It's going to happen. He just simply was waiting for his time. How many aeons... Billions, trillions of years that may have taken for it to happen, we don't know. But it did indeed happen. And now we're sitting here as the benefactors of that. And this God who made a plan from way back then has now said, come and eat at my table and you can have fellowship with me. We're the recipients of a long-range plan of God. I mean, look at that again. 
chosen us in him back then. Now we know that God is a stickler for details. Doesn't mean he chose the church as a group back then. He chose us individually back then. Let that bother your mind. Keep in mind. You're listening to somebody to you're talking about a God who deals in galaxies with billions of stars per galaxy. Numbers. He says the very hairs on your head are numbered. I've counted them. When I made you, I've, I, I, know, I know all of them. So he chose us and him individually before the foundation of the world to have salvation. That's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. To call somebody before they were born. You know? I mean, that's, that's something. Hand-picked back then. God is the originator of planned parenthood. He knows how many kids are going to have from day one. There's no mystery when somebody gets saved to God. He already knew it. He knew their time. There's a scripture in Isaiah that I preach sometimes. It's one of my favorite texts in Isaiah. It says, I was, I was not looking, but God found. I'm going to paraphrase him, okay? And had no idea who I was looking for, and he found me. Happened to all of us. We had to protest by some time, so you know, I went to the meeting one night, my heart wasn't right, and something got a hold of me. They had no idea that something had a hold of them before the foundation of the world. Already guaranteeing their salvation, and if everything goes wrong, he backs it up. As Hebrew says, with his own blood, he entered into the Holy of Holies and laid down sacrifice for sin and toned all things in the, in the tabernacle and guaranteed that salvation. That's why your chances of going to heaven are like 100% or zero. Period. And that's why we celebrate this communion. He said, you show forth my death till I come. Show forth his death. You also are showing forth the fact that he is alive. I'm going to tell you right now, this is going to come out of the mere communion supper realm pretty soon. It's going to become reality for everybody. We're going to go through a situation that the Lord showed me pieces of it. And I think he's doing it that way because I can't take the whole thing at one time. I really believe that. But it's going to be a deception that I have not really been able to quite communicate yet. Okay? So, he took the bread. He said, this is my body. It was broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In Jesus' name. And he took the cup. This is my blood. That is shed for remission of sins. Take this in remembrance of me. In Jesus' name. The final, the last day issue is going to be all about him. Communion is not making it more spiritual. When you eat the, bre the bread and drink the wine, you don't have to feel anything. It's a celebration of a fact. It says you have fellowship. When you do so forth the Lord's death till he comes. All right. Okay. Let's turn to Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four. I don't know who asked the question. Okay, so don't don't identify yourself. I just heard it. Okay. <laughs> I was telling Shelly before I came out this morning. I said a lot of people are going to get destroyed. Going to get destroyed, not destroyed. That's the wrong word. Killed. Killed. Put to sleep. In the upcoming months, just because they won't follow directions. Okay. 
We should learn about God by now, and we should know by God, about God that God gives things and says line upon line. He never takes you to the ultimate destination in the first order. So we got to, he's given us, he told me to tell you this, okay, I'm trying to this message here, this part, this part of the message. Take step one, just go there. Turn to Thessalonians. And then, like I know take some tests in school before, wait for further instruction. We don't know if it's going to be first or second, we just go to Thessalonians. And I will hold up. And just wait around. So much of God involved is doing that. We want to know exactly what we're going to do because we don't know where we're going to go so we can read it and see what the rest is going to be about. <laughs> right? And that's the whole idea, isn't it? You know, sometimes when you're reading it in church and I get mad at you, you know, you don't see where, where's, where's it going with this. Or you see something great, you know, sometimes you're telling after church, you know, why don't you go down to that verse on there? I said, why were you reading it? <laughs> why are you reading that verse on there? I said, I didn't go there. You know, yeah, no business even knowing that verse existed behind what I was talking about. Right? So first, just basically follow orders. Just take it one at a time. One at a time. Now we're going to go to First Thessalonians, chapter 4. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now God again has given us the details. I thought we had this scripture about three months ago, I preached the message, and I thought I knew it all. Okay? Didn't. Alive. I'm more, I'm more interested in this last part today. Remain. Remain. We're getting ready to go through what is called a false or fake tribulation. And Satan's going to kill millions in this fake one. You got an earth right now that has six billion people. Officially, there's more than that. If a hundred million were to be exterminated, so we can make everybody think that the rapture already happened and the day of Christ is at hand, and make them want a world leader who will put things back in order, that's not very many. Hundred million is not very many people. But we have never seen anything even like 50,000 killed in an event in our day. If a death toll runs up into near 10,000, that's a major, major calamity. The closest we've seen lately is Turkey, two or three thousand people. We try to imagine two or three thousand dead, it's hard for us to do. But you're going to start seeing, certainly, situations where a million were killed. Five million killed. This whole city destroyed. You watch enough movies now to have heard of this term and understand it. Acceptable losses. The military uses that term very freely. They'll tell you right now if you have a war, there's going to be some civilian casualties. And they decide if these losses are acceptable or not. To get what they want to get done. When they were fighting that war over there in Serbia, they had an acceptable loss number of around 50,000. Something isn't what men will do, okay? But here we have an angel in charge. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying your chances of getting taken out are there. You said, well, you said before, no one's going to get taken out. That's right. There's a condition to it, though. It's conditional. Whether or not you remain alive during the next four or five months. All right? He made some fantastic promises. He said, a thousand will fall to your right hand. Ten thousand, and it won't come near to you. Is that true or not, Laura? If that's, if that's true, then I can't be taken out. Correct? That's 
right. Well, look at that. Doesn't work, okay? Second Timothy, go there. God is getting us ready for a conflict, you guys. What are you doing? Chapter three. Very good. Nobody asked what's happened. You almost did. I had to say very good before you did. Somebody, somebody almost did. <laughs> Second Timothy three verse one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. This scripture trying to read it scares me. I said before. Let's look at it again. I'm so surprised how many scriptures for the church take place in this boundary line of the rapture and the tribulation. A lot of scriptures for the church. You got the first church age covered in, Matthew, in, in um, Revelation chapter 2. Takes about seven verses. The whole church age is covered. You got a few more verses that covers the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth church age, seventh church age. But the details in Scripture, there is so much detail surrounding this little short period of time here. That I believe, for sure, dates from October 1997 until sometime real early that year. Short period. But a lot happened. During that window of time, the time will turn perilous. What are perilous times? I'll give you an example. Turn to Second Corinthians. There goes Shirley. Second Corinthians. Chapter eleven. Now, Paul is glorying in the Lord here, and he knows that he really shouldn't be saying some things he's saying. So he says in verse number 16, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this condition of boasting. And he goes on and talks about his boasting some more. Verse number 24, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am. I'm more minister than they are. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prison more frequent. In death off. Paul. In labors, he says, right? What else? Stripes. Prison, death. These are ways of peril that are coming up. Labors. Now I'm beginning to understand some of those classes we had. I was in that reading week after week. When we talked about these labor camps or slave camps that our nation is obviously assembling. Not just our nation. But it's part of the United Nations, the world order situation. I talk about the prison there in Georgia that has never been used, that has a full staff capable of housing 400,000 inmates. And we have those all over the country that are standing empty. Why would you build something like that? Unless you plan to do a massive roundup of people and imprison them. Is that something? You're not talking about future crime. All the politicians are talking about spending more money for crime to go down. And crime has been going down statistical-wise. So why these, multi, these massive prisons standing ready and waiting? Usually, beside, usually built along railroad tracks or having railroad tracks built beside them, leading up to them. They plan to round up and lock up a bunch of people at one time. The same way the Nazis did when Hitler took over. They went to houses, neighborhoods, and rounded up all the dissidents, political ag ag agitators, 
non-religious people and put them all together at once. Well, it's the exact same thing happened in these last days. Again, look at... I'm not going to turn there because I can't find it right now. In Revelation, it talks about Babylon, the things that were sold in Babylon. The last thing I mentioned was the souls of men. You can't sell the souls of men unless you got their bodies. Period. These are your areas of peril. We don't know where we might get dispatched to. That's what I said. God has given us all this stuff because he says, don't forsake this and yourselves together because before it all shakes out, you may not be together at all. Period. And all we have is a consolation of knowing that this is the end and he's going to take us out of here. Okay? I may not have the luxury of being with my wife and children until it's over. And it's time now we have to start facing those particular facts because it may very well happen just like that. Not just a matter of not having the church, the saints around. And do I have enough word in me to stand up on my own alone? That's the question. All right? Strike. Torture. Why should we be exempt from that? Keep your finger there in Second Corinthians. Go to Hebrews. Chapter 11. Verse 32. Now what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdom. Right? You're going to uh, do some damage to a kingdom before the days are over. <coughs> Wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. He's giving you a preview of what's going to happen. He's not just telling you about what has been done. He's telling you what's going to come. Somebody experienced these things for real. Saints. Saints in past times experienced these things that he wrote about here. And he put them there. He says, these things are written for your admonition, for your example, upon whom the end of the age will come. What do you mean, Lord? All these things that I'm talking about here. So we're going to play a role in subduing kingdoms. Working righteousness, obtaining promises, stopping the mouths of lions, quenching the violence of fire, escaping the edge of the sword, becoming strong out of weaknesses, waxing dying in fight, and turning to flight the armies of the aliens. It's amazing that last one you mentioned last there. Because you don't really know about any situation in the history of the church where that's happened. Ain't there. Nowhere has this church ever actually waged a war against anybody. It's been a body of believers. The other things we talked about have taken place. This is what happened. Move on. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured. Not accepting deliverance. You're going to be offered deliverance. How will you be offered it? By simply saying, Renounce, renounce Jesus. Remember, it says that the Antichrist will deny the Father and Son, and he expects that out of everybody who, he, who wants to be spared. And so he said, I'm not going to do that. So you're tortured. He said, I'm not going to do it. So they threaten death. He said, I'm not going to do it. And so you're killed. That's why the scripture, before it's all over, means that's what it says. Those that are alive and remain. And God's getting ready for it to know that you're going to go through an intense persecution whereby it may take you out. Are you going to die? That's it. We're facing the same decision Jesus was faced with. Will I take up that cross and go all the way with it? Let me tell us again that story about one of my sons sitting on this side and one on the other side. And he asked me, he says, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? 
And they said, we'd be able. Right? And Jesus came back on it real quick and says, indeed you shall. That wasn't just for those two boys. It's for us. Indeed you shall drink of that cup and be baptized with that baptism I'm baptized with. Church is okay. It's going to church, you know. We thought we had troubles in church. We thought we had trials and persecutions going to church. No. And it started there. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in half. They were tempted. I mean, tempted is being threatened to be cut in half every day while you're locked up. While you're being brainwashed with the propaganda that this Jesus who you've been following ain't the one. He's not coming. Don't keep expecting his deliverance or it's not going to be a rapture. That's a bunch. This whole Bible that you all been believing is a lie. Don't look for somebody to come and snatch you out of here. He's not going to show up. Where's the promise? They're going to ask you, where's the promise of his coming? Still waiting for Jesus, huh? Well, while you're waiting, let me give you something to think about and torture you a little bit. Come back next day, are you still waiting? All these things that mentioned here are case histories of what have, has happened to saints down through the ages. Okay? Right? Down through the ages. It's not what could happen, they did happen. We've been, Satan has messed the church up to such a degree, again, that he has totally eliminated suffering and persecution from the whole program and replaced it with blessing and prosperity. The visible church, not to worry about this because they're not going to go through this in the first place. The true church will. If you think Satan doesn't know who we are, you know the thing coming. He knows exactly who we are. He's had years to identify you. You know that? There's no hiding here. This here message, suffering and persecution, has subsided in today's church. Jesus preached it. The apostles preached it. Evidently, quite a few saints experienced it. But what have we experienced in this last day along those lines? Nothing. Our Christian ride has been real smooth and eventless. The most of the deal with is somebody in an auxiliary that we didn't like. Or the church across the street. Something petty. Something also minor. We've made a major thing, but they've been minor. They've been nothing. We're going to do some things before we go. Period. And the Lord has given us the greatest hint he could in First Thessalonians. It says that those which are alive and remain. Period. Shall be caught up. And they're going to threaten you with death all on the way to here. And will I hold fast to my testimony? And those that do, I'm convinced of the fact that he's going to keep them around. You're going to do exploits. And that's why God has given you so much information. God is not, let me put it this way to you. God did not give you, sometimes the military will tell you, or sometimes your job might tell you this, that we've invested too much in you. Okay? AT&T was notorious for telling you that they don't want to fire you because it costs us too much to train you, to get you ready. Some jobs that way. The military will tell you, we've invested too much in you to just throw out to the battlefield. There are certain people that they've trained extensively over years, and their safety is paramount to them. They don't like losing pilots. It's too expensive. God would not be taking you through the training exercise, getting information he's giving you to see you getting taken out in the first week. That's the point at all. You've got some elite forces. All right? 
David had a group of men that were elite. They were fighters. And they killed hundreds. They're renowned men. They're written down in the book, their names, as being great warriors. And great warriors have to live, outlive the enemy. And they did. And you're going to. And those who are going to make it to the end are those who are going to continue in his word. You knew that scripture was coming up, didn't you? You knew that was coming up, didn't you? You knew it. You knew it. Had to. The more word he's given you, the more of an investment God has made in you. Because he needs those like us here to the end. At the end, he does not want the idiots. The idiots have to go. It, the, the, the idiots are the foot soldiers. They're the front line troops that get shot at. The saints are not continuing his word. Yeah, he has a role for them. But they're going to, they're going to have the highest casualties. Talking war, okay? In Vietnam, the United States, 13%. Of the world's population, of the nation's population at that time. 30% of all the war casualties were the black population in Vietnam. We have a lot of people who did not go, not in college. The college people, you remember, they got deferment. They didn't go. The ones who weren't in college went and became soldiers doesn't change in the spiritual realm. The ones that he leaves the least, the least who have gotten the least amount of word, are dispensable. They're going to go. He's going to still save them, but they're going to feel the wrath of the executioner. And their chances of surviving it are less than other ones because they have not continued his word. They've been saved. They have no idea what's going to come up. A lot of them are going to say, like the Thessalonians saw, they're going to say the day of Christ is at hand. They don't really believe that they, they missed it. Again, I can't even begin to prepare you for the kind of devastation that we're going to see. Because we've never seen it before. We have never seen it on that level before. We've never seen a whole coastal area of land taken out before. Never. Mount St. Helens, we saw that blow up. But it's like in the wilderness. We've never seen anything like maybe, let's say, like Mount Rainier, let's say, up in Seattle, Tacoma area. Suppose that gets activated. As I say, it's going now. It's beginning to start, showing some signs of life. And it becomes a full-blown volcano. And it erupts and takes out Seattle and Tacoma. Because they're right at the, they're right at the base there. It's a huge mountain. You can see it for, like, it's visible 50, 60 miles. Right? It erupts, takes out those cities. That... We had never seen it before. Ever. We don't always like to pick the newspaper and see that 20 million dead in the United States last night. Because what happened? Except in this case, there's going to be such devastation that there won't be a paper to read. Imagine something like happening that, you know, you, you lose touch with the rest of the world. You're waiting for relief, like in Mexico City, they're waiting for relief, hopefully from the United States and what have you. And it's only to find out, let's say, that the United States in the same situation you're in, there will be no relief coming. What a wonderful message. Second Corinthians, chapter 11. Perilous times shall come, he said. Paul gives an illustration of perilous times. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Twice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in the water. In journeyings often. <clears throat> Perils of waters. Okay? Pause there for a minute. Don't start reading ahead. I'll go ahead and read. Just read as much as you want. I'm going to take the restriction off of reading. Just read as much as you want. If you want to live through the whole thing, stop reading. If you want to, you know, take your chances, keep on reading every second. All right. Perils of waters. A 
kind of parallels the water, the water brain. Since that's how we're not fish, we can't breathe this stuff, can we? And the possibility of drowning becomes real. And you have no idea how many of these last day schemes are going to call for waters rising up and drowning people. Paul talked about that. Perils of waters. In perils of robbers. They'll be part of the scenario in these last days. In perils by my own countrymen. People I thought I could trust if I couldn't. In perils by the heathen. That's expected. But nothing like it's been. Nothing like it's going to be, rather. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. Something like different than we're at. Okay? In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. He tells you in Timothy, perilous times shall come, and Paul details them. These are the ones that are coming. And expect to come from all these fronts. Perilous times from waters. First one he mentions. Waters. So interesting. And of all these calamities that are going to take place, this one here is rank number one. They keep talking about the massive flood that's going to occur. As you know, yesterday and today was the day that the comets were supposed to impact. And it's on the internet the other day that they shot them down. Never even made the news. At all. Because they were very busy on the news saying that, you know, during the eclipse they didn't see anything. That was NASA's official explanation. There was nothing. He didn't see anything during the eclipse. Our cameraman did not see anything. He's trying to pan out and talk about, he thought, he thought maybe it was Venus. He made a comment on it. And it wasn't Venus. Venus was way out way. But their cameraman who was panning out and found an object didn't find anything. Okay? Lots of lies coming down. They said, had that impacted in the... Well, it's supposed to be in Europe. I don't know what they're, how to draw the map, but we'll just make it in Europe. Then he got down here in Africa. Coast of Africa, one's supposed to impact there, one impact there, and one in Siberia. He said, this one here, Eastern coast of the United States, 3,000 miles away, it'll cause coastal flooding to such a degree that they expected it would wipe out most of the East Coast city. That's what they expected. Okay? Evidently, they weren't quite ready for that. These little, all, all three of these things are going to be man made objects, anyhow. So they have some kind of control over them. And that plan got changed. But that's what they expected to happen had it impacted them. I mean, you get a big down there. Now you got a tidal wave coming. <coughs> England, they said, would have been gone. We ain't time for England to go yet. God made some promises. God said this dynasty will last forever. You can be sure if one hits England, a tidal wave hits England, that dynasty would be spared. They ain't going to be there. It might take out Buckingham Palace, but that dynasty would be moved. God made promises. Remember, Satan, just like, you know, he's been trying to eliminate Israel. He knows, what that, he knows what that throne is. That city of London has seen more threats over the years than any other city in the world. He's tried to take out, he's tried to have Hitler bomb the city to, to, to smithering. Couldn't do it. Because God protected that. That's his. Won a real war. Time to wake up to that fact. Okay? This article... I made at least four copies of this as I started teaching this about, you know, the last three times. And I told Shelly, I said, this is the most hiding piece of paper I ever had to deal with. It's there on Sunday, and it shows its face. Or so on Monday, rather. And it shows its face on Tuesday. And I'll pin it down to a place where I'm going to make sure I have it on Wednesday. And it's gone. And it comes Thursday, it says hi. Come back. Friday, Saturday, come Sunday, it disappears again. It's done that several times now. Question here I'm reading about is how did the occultists explain Jupiter igniting into a star? Remind, keep your finger back in Timothy again. Go back there. Second Timothy. Just know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall 
takes a lot of audacity for some men to actually think that they can ignite a planet into a star. Think about that for a minute. We're going to change our universe and create a star. That's scary. They've never done it before. It's going to be so scary, and who knows what are going to be the effects from it, okay, that God stamped a number on it. So you wouldn't be frightened. That's all it's about. He put this number on here to let you know that I still keep my promises, and my word still stands, and when they start shaking the universe, I'm going to still come through. What are you telling me? Because it ain't going to just be a little tiny explosion. Who knows what is going to go wrong when they do that? The ones who protested that Cassini flight, they protested on the basis of when this thing took off, I could do so many times, say here's, which it could have. When it got to orbit, suppose the orbit decay, suppose something goes wrong. It would have sent 49.7 pounds of plutonium back down here and blew the whole planet. And they took that risk. This thing had to, you know, go around here before it got off, before it got into its route up to Jupiter. It had to orbit the Earth. And the protesters knew that something could go wrong. When the rockets could fail to boost, and it comes pumping back down again. And the whole Earth would have been destroyed. New Age author Bill Cooper explains this plan the best in his book, Behold a Pale Horse. So we will quote him. According to many, the Great Pyramids were built to commemorate and observe a supernova explosion that occurred in the year 4000 B.C. Dr. Anthony Hewish, 1974 Nobel Prize winner in physics, <coughs> discovered a rhythmic series of radio pulses, which he proved were emissions from a star that had exploded around 4000 B.C. The Freemasons begin their calendar from A.L. in the year of Lucis. Who do you think that is? By adding 4,000 to the modern year. That's 1990. This is written back 1990. From William Cooper's book. Thus 1990 plus 4,000 equals 5,990. George Makanowski wrote... The once and future star that the ancient Sumerian cuneiform described a giant star exploding within a triangle formed by three different constellations you mentioned that are nowhere in anybody's book. Okay. An accurate star catalog <coughs> now stated that the blazing star that had exploded within the triangle would again be seen by man in the year in 6,000 years. According to the Freemasons calendar, it will occur in the year 2000, and indeed it will. The spacecraft Galileo is on its way to Jupiter. A baby star with the gaseous makeup exactly the same as our sun, with a load of 49.7 pounds of plutonium, supposedly being used as batteries to power the craft. That's what NASA told us when it took off. When it's final, and they said they had a five pounds of plutonium would be enough to power the batteries from here into eternity. When its final orbit decays in December 1999, Galileo will deliver its payload into the center of Jupiter. The unbelievable pressure that will be encountered will cause the reaction exactly as occurs when an atomic bomb is exploded by an implosion detonator. The plutonium will explode in an atomic reaction, lighting the hydrogen and helium atmosphere of Jupiter and resulting in the birth of the star that has already been named Lucifer. Which it could have. When it got to orbit... Suppose the orbit decay, suppose something goes wrong. It would have sent 49.7 pounds of plutonium back down here and blew the whole planet. <laughs> and they took that risk. This thing had to, you know, go around here before it got off, before it got into its route up to Jupiter. It had to orbit the Earth. And the protesters knew that something could go wrong. When the rockets could fail to boost, and it comes pumping back down again. And the whole Earth would have been destroyed. New Age author Bill Cooper explains this plan the best in his book, Behold a Pale Horse. So we will quote him. 
According to many, the Great Pyramids were built to commemorate and observe a supernova explosion that occurred in the year 4000 B.C. Dr. Anthony Hewish, 1974 Nobel Prize winner in physics, discovered a rhythmic series of radio pulses, which he proved were emissions from a star that had exploded around 4000 B.C. The Freemasons begin their calendar from A.L. in the year of Lucis. Who do you think that is? By adding 4,000 to the modern year. Thus, 1990. This is written back 1990. From William Cooper's book. Thus, 1990 plus 4,000 equals 5,990. George Mikanowski wrote the once and future star that the ancient Sumerian cuneiform described a giant star exploding within a triangle formed by three different constellations you mentioned that are nowhere in anybody's book. Okay. An accurate star catalog <coughs> now stated that the blazing star that had exploded within the triangle would again be seen by man in, the year, in 6,000 years. According to the Freemasons calendar, it will occur in the year 2000, and indeed it will. The spacecraft Galileo is on its way to Jupiter. A baby star with the gaseous makeup exactly the same as our sun, with a load of 49.7 pounds of plutonium, supposedly being used as batteries to power the craft. That's what NASA told us when it took off. When it's final, and they said the, they had a, five pounds of plutonium would be enough to power the batteries from here into eternity. When its final orbit decays in December, 1999, Galileo will deliver its payload into the center of Jupiter. The unbelievable pressure that will be encountered will cause the reaction exactly as occurs when an atomic bomb is exploded by an implosion detonator. The plutonium will explode in an atomic reaction, lighting the hydrogen and helium atmosphere of Jupiter and resulting in the birth of the star that has already been named Lucifer. Documents I read while in Naval Intelligence stated that Project Galilea required only five pounds of plutonium to ignite Jupiter. I only need five to ignite the planet, and God had him take 49.7. This thing's going to go so wrong and be so devastating that you might think that your number's on this one, what it is. But not to go out, your number of God's promises that I'm going to keep. Again, perilous times shall come. Perilous. Okay. I'm going to say it like that to everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Perilous. Okay. Can you say perilous? All right? Yeah. We can't identify with it. We can't relate to it. We have no idea what it's going to be like. This gospel is going to be frightening enough, though, that I want to let you know I'm going to let you know about the very pounds I'm going to allow the Lord on to that I'll have you in my care. Because it's going to seem as if everything, the whole creation is out of control. You're going to think that the tribulation has started. It's just a little fake thing Satan's doing to get control of the world. It's time short. We have been able to substantiate this information from another credible occult source. While Bill Cooper only stated that Galileo would decay its orbit in December 1999, our source for the specific date of December 6th has emphatically stated that the orbit will be forced to decay on this specific day using your small guidance rockets to turn the spacecraft into Jupiter. I imagine what they're going to be saying to you, you know, to you and I on the news as that comes around, is that you're going to get a little bit of information about their experience, some difficulties with the probe around Jupiter. And NASA's working on it. And they're going to talk about an engine fire or something like that. Okay? And, of course, it's going to, you know, they can't just say they're going to blow up the planet and turn it into a sun. This thing's supposed to just appear after 6,000 years, according to the Freemasons. Not to be created. Okay? It seems pretty contagious, outrageous. It seems pretty outrageous to think of Jupiter becoming a star. Some investigation of the makeup of Jupiter on some scientific websites is in order, especially because of Cooper's bold statement that Jupiter has a makeup exactly like that of the sun. Here are a few comments about Jupiter from the... Boom, boom, boom. Got to eliminate it. Jupiter contains two-thirds of the planetary mass of the solar system. 
In composition, it resembles a small star. Electrical activity in Jupiter is so strong that it pours billions of watts into Earth's own magnetic field every day. No planet has greater influence on its neighbors. Most of its mass is hydrogen and helium. It does not burn like the sun. Models of star formation suggest that Jupiter's mass is only about one eightieth of the mass needed for ignition, which occurs due to heating from internal gravitational collapse. Jupiter's smaller size leaves its center too cool to ignite. What they're saying is that for Jupiter to turn to a sun, it needs to be about 80 times bigger than what it is. It's pretty big. This is 80 times too small. Since Jupiter does not produce energy by nuclear fusion as in the sun, it is much too small, and hence its interior is too cool to ignite nuclear reactions. Jupiter is just about as large in diameter as a gas planet can be. If more material were added, it would be compressed by gravity, such that the overall radius would increase only slightly. A star can be larger only because of its internal nuclear heat, but Jupiter would have to be at least 80 times more massive to become a star. Well now, if it's too small to ignite, what's going to happen? These comments from NASA and the Astronomy Reserve Research Group seem to be clear that Jupiter could never ignite on its own. We then pose the following question to the Arizona Space Exploration and Astronomy Research Group. Could Jupiter be ignited by a huge nuclear device? The answer we got was, quote, Jupiter could not be ignited. The central temperature is a determining factor. A self gravitating mass of hydrogen, 20% the size of the sun or smaller, does not have a high enough central temperature to induce nuclear fusion. Temperature equates to average kinetic energy of particles, and it takes a very high temperature to get even a small fraction of hydrogen into, of ions to overcome their electrical repulsion and fuse. The base is saying that we can blow it up, but they're trying to ignite it. They said the center of Jupiter is too cool to sustain burning. Now, I don't know much about nuclear fusion. I'm not a physicist at all. But our sun out there is a great, big, huge nuclear reactor. The amazing thing about something that's 93 million miles away, you get light and heat from it. How long has it been out there? Well, a long time. The Earth, it says, 4.3 billion years. All that fuel has been burning for 4.3 billion years, and it hasn't run out of gas yet. It's still going. I'm trying to make you think that it's dying. And when the truth, they're trying to kill it. Okay? And that's what they expect this planet to do, the same thing the sun is doing. Turn to a nuclear reactor and keep on producing heat and light. And they're saying that it can't do it. Now, if they're telling you this can't be done, and your experts are saying it can't be done, why would they persist in doing it? My question. We were still not sure exactly why Jupiter could not ignite, especially if it were hit with the huge atomic explosions, explosion of 1.750 megatons, as the cult sources are saying will occur when the 49 pounds of plutonium in the spacecraft Galileo is turned into the planet on December 6th. After all, the largest thermonuclear explosion on Earth was a Russian test of only 100 megatons in, 19, in 1961. The answer received from a Christian scientist, Dr. Kent Hoven, explained the science to us so we can understand. He says in the NASA excerpt quoted above, we learned that most of the mass of Jupiter is hydrogen and helium, a most explosive mix. If it is mixed with sufficient oxygen in order to burn this mixture, this is helium and hydrogen must be mixed with oxygen to burn. There's only one small problem. There's not much oxygen up on Jupiter. Hardly any at all. They don't think there's any. I mean, the laws that govern things don't change in the universe. Any fire has to have air 
and a fuel source to burn. Well, same thing with space. They have the same components to burn. The chemistry hasn't changed. He says, Jupiter does not contain enough oxygen in order to sustain the type of continuous burning that would be needed to produce a star. Now we understand, and now it all makes sense. No matter how large the initial explosion might be, the lack of sufficient quantities of oxygen would snuff out any resulting fire rather quickly. So, if they know this, and I believe they do, then they're not intending to make Jupiter a star. So my question is, what are they intending to do? What is the point? We'll find out pretty soon, won't we? Doesn't it make you feel confident? You know there's a spacecraft in there right now in, in, in our in our planetary system with enough explosives to blow up the whole planet Earth, at least, and the moon, and Mars, what have you. And it's just out, you know, a little bit further than we are, a few hundred million miles, and they're gonna blow it up. Men, perilous times shall come when men shall do whatever they have imagined to do, and God said, nothing will be withheld from them. I'm going to let them do it. Whatever they want. Scary. Scary time shall come. But you're in Him. And we're in Him. And again, God's giving such a scenario that He needs you around to the end. How many churches have what you have? He hasn't conducted these kind of classes with everybody. He's put you in an advanced training program. He's given you hidden manna. He needs you around as an effective witness to the very end. So, my advice to you this morning is to continue in his word. Amen. Be it to the very end. Okay?